the thing that I'm most preoccupied with in the Divine Cities Foundry side and the Tainted Cup is change, is how circumstances require change, how the evolution and suddenly the the rights of people, the resources they have permit them to change themselves, to change how they prefer to live, to, to allow them to become more of themselves. Um, and how change often leads to conflict, to disruption, um, to situations that at first seem better, but maybe not are. Um, and that's probably why a lot of my works are more akin to science fiction than they are to fantasy. Because fantasy frequently looks backward. I'm not the first one to point this out. But there was a, a post today about how, like, if you were a kid who grew up before the Internet, um, then it's a little like being an elf from Tolkien's world who saw the last light of the two trees. And I was like, oh, OK. But, like, that kind of speaks to that trope in fantasy of there once was a wonderful world. But then through the follies of men uh, or through like mortals or whoever, things went terribly awry and now everything is broken and ruined. And if we could only get the right person on the throne, maybe we could regain some shred of that power. This kind of functions alongside the Garden of Eden, which is like once there was paradise, we fucked it all up. It's impossible to go back. What is up, everybody? You're listening to episode 90 of SFF Addicts. I'm your host, Adrian M. Gibson, and welcome to your weekly dive into the world of science fiction, fantasy, and writing craft. Joining me, as always, is my co-host, the Chewy to my Han Solo, the Joker to my Commander Shepard, MJ Kuhn. How's it going, MJ? Hi there. I'm doing lovely. How are you? Doing very well. I'm uh, not in my parents' basement, but I'm at my in-law's bedroom, so that's, uh, you know, (laughs) it's a good time. You're on the road today. (laughs) I'm on the road, man. field reporter. Yeah, I just packed up all my shit (laughs) as well. If you would like to support this lovely human being, MJ Kuhn, and her work, you can buy Among Thieves and its awesome sequel, Thick as Thieves, which is a complete duology for all your ass-kicking needs and thieving and heists and all that fun stuff. And we talked about heists with Robert Jackson Bennett, so you're going to get a I don't know how many doses of that in these books. So you're going to have a good time. So many doses. Yeah. I love that you brought so them with doses. you with your setup. I didn't think you'd have them yeah. with you today because you're on the I road. I got to. I got to. Re- <laughs> I got to. My, my girl's books. Oh, that's my what God. I gotta that's do. amazing. <laughs> um, as well, you can uh, check out the official cover for my debut novel, Mushroom Blues. The reveal happened um, when we're recording in the past right now, but it happened on January 17th. So you can check that out. The book is out on March 19th. So stay tuned for more info on that if you want some mushrooms and police procedurals and all kinds of icky, sticky stuff. It's going to be a good time Um, (laughs) as well. A quick note for listeners, the official SFF Addicts Patreon and merch store are live. So check the links in the description to support what we do here. You can also rate and review the podcast on your favorite podcast app and subscribe to the FanFatic YouTube channel where this and every other episode of the show is available in full video. And now welcoming today's guest, Robert Jackson Bennett award-winning author of the Founders Trilogy, the Divine Cities Trilogy, and more, including the soon-to-be-released The Tainted Cup. I even brought Robert's books. Oh, wow. There's Foundry's side. There's Hardcover, too. That's heavy. There's. Oh, yeah. And, um, yeah, welcome back to SFF Addicts, Robert. How are you doing? It's, it's great to be back here. Yeah, man. Thanks for being here, and uh, very excited to chat about your new book. But let's kick things off with an introduction for listeners who aren't familiar with you, your work. Can you tell us a little bit about yourself? Sure. Uh, I write stories that operate as different stories, but are dressed up as fantasy. Like, for example, The Divine Cities is a spy trilogy that looks like a fantasy. Foundry Side series is cyberpunk that looks like fantasy. And um, The Tainted Cup is a murder mystery that is dressed up as a fantasy. There's beards, there's swords, there's magic, there's towers, (laughs) there's occasionally horses, there's all those things. 
but uh, the guts, the machinery underneath it, the pistons that fire, uh, the tracks that it runs on, those are different from what I think a lot of people have, have ingrained in their heads as a fantasy story, i.e. the young farm boy gets a relic and has to go save the world, or kings and queens duking it out, trying to kill each other's families in order to gain control of the throne, that kind of stuff. There is some of that, but um, the way that it operates, the point of the story, the beats, the cadences, those are different. Yeah, I explained uh, to MJ because she's reading your found, uh, Founders Trilogy books and then she read The Tainted Cup, but she hasn't read The Divine Cities. And I explained to yeah, her, it's, not like, yet. it's basically like a Cold War spy thriller, but like dressed up in like Eastern European fantasy. And I was like, so, yes, please. <laughs> yes, please. Yeah. No, that's good stuff, man. Yeah. Yeah. Before we dig deeper into the episode, a quick word from our sponsor. Novello is an exciting new publishing and reading platform whose goal is to be the go-to for all things writing and storytelling. Their platform offers an intuitive, user-friendly way for writers to create and share their awesome stories for readers to enjoy, all while maintaining total control over their stories. Everything from the content to cover art and pricing is all controlled by the story's author. Novello also offers social features such as message boards, direct messaging, and a news feed where you can post updates to your followers. With future plans including support for comics and a marketplace for users to sell other writing-related services, the future of this platform is looking bright. And the best part? It's all available for free. No sign-up fees, no membership, just a growing library of epic tales. Sign up now to bask in the magic of books where you can enjoy tales like Blackwater, an epic adventure by an award-winning author, or Limbo, the door above the lake, a terrifying battle for survival. Whether you're a casual reader or a professional writer, Novello is the place for you. Visit them at novello.com. That's N-O-V-E-L-O.com. And now, enjoy the rest of this episode of SFF Addicts. Well, we're all big nerds here, obviously, um, and we always like to talk with our guests about the nerd media that made them into the big old lovable nerd that they are today. So do you have books, movies, games, anything that you remember from growing up that you would consider like your nerd gateway drug? <clears throat> Let's see here. Well, I was the younger kid, so a lot of stuff that I got was hand-me-downs or what my brother was reading at the time, which means like the younger kid always grows up faster. Um, and I recall reading things like Narnia and, um, and I, and I seem to, I, I really liked reading that one backwards. I liked, um, the magician's, uh, nephew. That was my favorite one. Cause that, that one was all fucked up. So when we, when we went to like the red world. That one was my favorite. Um, and I wrote, you'll have to pardon. My kid is playing the next room. So if you hear any hooting and hollering, he's gaming with a friend. Uh, <laughs> but, um, his friend's there, which is a little bit better. They're gaming right next to each other. Uh, <laughs> but um, uh, on top of that, one of the things that really got me going was in junior high, a friend of mine was like, have you ever heard of this game called Warhammer 40K? And um, I found actually playing the game pretty shitty. Me too. Dude. Um, <laughs> I, I really liked making the models and I really liked reading the codexes and reading the weird little arcane rules about all the unique characters. But when it came down to actually sitting down and getting the dice and the rulers out and all that crap and having to buy like, you know, the templates for like what the flame, what like the flamethrowers yeah, like were doing. Like the, the thing that looks like a, like a part of like a geometry like an ice cream set <laughs> or like, yeah. like an ice cream cone, but like part of a geometry set. Yeah, I was dramatically less interested in that. <laughs> um, yeah, and because, I mean, like, it was just a lot of work, a lot of logistics to determine who won. And I found the lore of the game way more fascinating. So that was a big part of it as well. Um, and, yeah, like, uh, I remember reading lots of those, lots of Tolkien. Uh, I reread Tolkien uh, just this past year. It is really interesting where you can see the books, like, change from being a delightful story to being more of a saga. People start saying behold a lot. Behold. Um, and generally once you start beholding things, you can tell you're in a different kind of story. It goes from like, it goes into real high fantasy mode. 
uh, which is just kind of interesting to see now that you're a little bit older. But yeah, all, like all that kind of stuff I was really into. I still feel like uh, among all my friends, I'm the least – like they consider me the least nerdy one, which is interesting because among all the normies that I know, no one knows what the fuck I'm talking about. So I guess like for my other friends, they must be real nerds. Um like where like a hundred percent of their hobbies and activities are devoted to people with blasters or swords. Uh, but, um, but yeah, that kind of sums it up. I think just like the shifting gradient of, of nerdiness is like, right. Who yeah. knows anymore? I know. Well, that's, I've experienced yeah. that too, though, where I have friend groups where it's like, I am definitely like the least, I have no idea what they're talking about, but then I mm, consider right. myself like pretty dorky. So it's like, okay, where am I on this continuum? Like, I'm, a, I'm a fantasy author. What <laughs> yeah. I mean, I feel like I get pretty good bona fides, but like, uh, scavenger's reign. Like, have you guys watched that on HBO recently? Yeah. Yeah. It's really good. It is. Like, I can't find anyone in my life to recommend that to. <laughs> And like, because like, I'm like, it's really mystical and science fiction-y and violent and creepy. And they're like, no. <laughs> and I also like, but like, like I'm on my nerd fans. Like I can't get them to watch it either. It's the craziest thing. So like, I don't know. There's this weird, like strata of nerdery that I occupy where there's, where no one else is. I feel, <laughs> like, I feel, like, I feel like, yeah, I feel like we <laughs> occupy a pretty similar space. I'm so happy you yeah. mentioned Warhammer 40k. We talked with Ken Liu yeah. and he dropped Philip K. Dick and I was so excited. But you dropping Warhammer 40k, I had the exact same experience. My brother, all he wanted to do was play the actual game. And I'm just like, just go away. I just want to <laughs> paint and read like the paint. codex and buy the books. And I'm just like, no, I don't want to do that shit. <laughs> Yeah, no, it's a lot of work. I like the thing that was good about the codexes was that they always suggest this stuff happening off the page. Mm -hmm. uh, you don't really comprehend exactly what's happening. And that's one of the great things about world building. Like the way that works best is when it suggests as opposed to say explicitly what's happening here. Like I remember there's one character for the chaos army that you can do who basically once his, he was like, guarded by some sort of pan-dimensional god creature that has no name and when his hit points drop too low he would teleport from the map and not be counted as a death and i was like so cool huh yeah. <laughs> like that's super cool but i i, I don't like it's great anyway stuff no. like that would just get your brain going but like make you start trying to think things on your own yeah but that's exactly it because it's like engaging you a bit more because you have to incorporate your own imagination into the experience and i was curious like do you remember the moment you decided that you wanted to write your own fiction or at least like a, things that kind of pushed you along that path and, and getting towards, you know, eventually publishing. Yeah. Uh, it was Warcraft three was coming out and this was way before social media. So there were only forums and there was a fan fiction forum for Warcraft three. And I started writing crap for fun and people really liked it. And I was like, wow, am I good at this? I'm sure it was shit. <laughs> I'm sure it was absolute garbage because I was 12 or 13. And um, I can't imagine that it was anything good. And it was also about Warcraft 3. But uh, I was trying to write these all these dark, dark, dramatic stories set in this world that hadn't existed yet. Like the game hadn't come out. So you didn't know all the stories and stuff like that. So it was like in anticipation of it. And seeing people respond positively to my stories was like really exciting. And that was one of the moments where I was like, maybe I can do this professionally. Yeah. For sure. Well, what are, so you, obviously we have the founders trilogy, we have the divine cities trilogy, but I want to talk about like some of the bigger lessons that you've learned from your earlier works. So like Mr. Shivers, American elsewhere, those kinds of, uh, of tales. Mm -hmm. Um, what kind of lessons did you learn from those early projects and how are you finding ways to apply them all these years later? They're very different. Um, I would say it, like it's trickier with secondary worlds, uh, because there's a lot more work that you have to do. That's why it's actually, it's actually very, very hard to get. I found a secondary world below like 130 K that feels like word wise, that feels like it's got a lot of meat going on. 
or has the appropriate level of world building that people are expecting because you just have to do so much work to put to create these cool set pieces with suggested history and things like and things like that and then get them wrapped up in the plot uh, as far as those earlier works though they really taught me the importance of voice because they were describing uh, our own world but slightly different and it was a lot about how you can take earthly things and in the describing of them or the presentation of them, like whether or not it's a train or a theater or a neighborhood or a downtown, the way that you can describe them can feel unearthly and strange uh, and feel like it has a different set of rules applied to it. Um, this is, there's a lot of folks who do this great. I was a young white man with too much like schooling, which meant I was super into Cormac McCarthy. Every boy like that goes through a phase. It's very regrettable. <laughs> uh, but um, he is one of the masters of that, of, um, of making these earthly things feel strange and spectral and mythic. Um, and um, so that really taught me how to sort of shift voice and – turn on a dime and make people feel like uh, they had just just entered a place with different stakes, different rules, um, like a different world entirely. Yeah, because it's, yeah, like Cormac McCarthy, um, I think we talked about him a little bit before, but like the the ways in which he just kind of manipulates our perceptions of, of normalcy and and yeah, like I love how you use the word spectral because spectral is a really good word for something like blood meridian, which Oof. is like mm -hmm. a Heavy. time period which <laughs> which feels um, – obviously it's distant from us, but there's a familiarity, especially for people who right. live in America. But reading yeah. that book, it's just like – it's amazing how one can make reality feel um, otherworldly. It's amazing how one can make something like a book about – you know, the American Southwest feel like almost fantastical. You know what I mean? Yeah. And it, like, it's interesting because I'd argue that that book is actually one of his most like accessible because it has dudes mm -hmm. on horses with guns. Right. Some of his really like Faulknerian stuff that he did before that um, is really dark. I think one opens up with the girl giving birth in the woods and it's stillborn. She buries it in the dirt and it's like an incestuous baby. Um, but, um, like the, the, like it was written to take place in like the twenties or thirties. I can't recall the name of the story, but I remember the description of like the woods. And I was like, I have never read a fantasy story that manages to nail the mythic, strange feeling of a place as well as this right now. Now I had a bunch of $5 words that I think most editors would immediately be like, Nope, you're, you're not Cormac McCarthy. You can't do that. Um, but that like the uh, the um, the word that I use is a, like elevation, uh, like almost as though you've consumed a drug and it's just starting to kick in. When you walk into places like that, there's almost a psychedelic feel to it. And that was something that I definitely wanted to put in in a big way in the tainted cup where because in stuff like Foundry Side, they're like people read that because they love the rules, like the people who like come to that and stay there. They like the like engineering aspect of how all of this works. Um, but in the tainted cup, uh, when you get close to magic or it's close to the, the, like an earthly, it's trapped in the main character's head and he doesn't know the rules, which means that these moments feel larger, mythic, hyper real. Um, and that's a little bit more fun for me personally to write in. Uh, and founder saw to do a lot of tinkering, like engineering, um, trying to make rules feel delightful. Making rules feel delightful is not easy <laughs> or fun. I would get notes from like my editor, which would say like, you need to have this conclude in the same place, but just a little bit, a little bit more delightful, a little bit more pizzazz here. Just make that happen. And I was like, great. You're like, cool. No pressure. <laughs> just throw in yeah. some pizzazz, Robert. That's all it needs. It's like, you're so funny. Why don't you tell some jokes? And you're like, oh, hi, I just met all these people. Um, <laughs> But um, so that was trickier. And so try like the high fantasy aspects of the Tainted Cup where it is someone beholding um, these things that are uncanny. 
um, it is a little bit more in my wheelhouse, I would say. Yeah, because that's something you did in, in the, the Divine Cities trilogy as well, is yeah. you, you yeah. played a lot with the boundaries between normal and, and uncanny in really fun and like creepy ways. I would say more creepy than than funny and pizzazz and all that kind of stuff. But um, <laughs> Creepy can be pizzazz. <laughs> Sure, MJ. Some <laughs> creepy pizzazz is all you need in life. But um, I like how you're doing a little bit of compare and contrast between some of the stuff that you've that you've written. Um, you know, with the Founders trilogy, it's one of your more well-known works. Um, could you tell us a bit more about how the idea for Foundry Side came to be, but then also how how you went about creating the magic system, and then later on we can touch a little bit on the Tainted Cup and and your approaches for that. Sure. Like I'd had the idea for a long time uh, of trying to write a series that would attack what magic was, because in a lot of stories, magic is nonsense. Um, it's mostly like a ball of light that you learn how to shoot with your hands, but you have to make yourself feel a certain way to do it. It doesn't make a lot of sense. Um and uh, the thing that really got me into it was Harry Potter, which is very whimsical, but then builds on the whimsy to a degree that like, like the first books are all whimsy. And then later on, it gets to be serious. Like, here's a government made out of whimsy. And you're like, that doesn't work. Um, <laughs> but um, you start to have these questions. Like, lies. <laughs> yeah, like they are taught that they that there's like a little tool that they have that has the hair of a unicorn embedded in it. Um, and that they have to hold it and move it and stand it in a certain way and say Latin words, like specific Latin words, and also cultivate an emotion within themselves while they do all this to alter reality, to create birds or to shoot water or things like that. And I thought, like, how would someone figure that out? <laughs> how would someone, like, experiment to get there? Um, and not have this people, intuition. yeah, intuition or did God tell them, is this divine? <laughs> like, uh, but, um, and like, I started thinking like, how would one create a magic system that you could actually explore naturally, try and uh, like iterate towards success, um, where the rules could be explored and somewhat comprehended. And my first idea was to create a magic system that functioned like law, like legal codes, with where a spell is a contract with reality, saying, you're going to change this way once I do all this stuff. Um, and then you'd have to sign it. But then there would be all these guys uh, with a lot of degrees and a lot of, and a lot of comprehension who could find loopholes in the law to get around stuff. This is classic like fairy stuff, basically. But I wanted to make it like a system that could be exploited and abused on a mass scale. I thought that sounded kind of fun. Um, and so I was actually at a hotel. I remember I was at a hotel in Houston in a Hampton Inn um, trying to figure out how the shower worked because uh, it was one of those new ones. Um, and I remember thinking, like, wouldn't it be a lot easier if I made this more like code, if this is more like software uh, where you have to define a thing and then call upon that thing you defined and put in the correct syntax and it all had to work together or else something would explode. Um, and I was like, yeah, that works. And then I thought, okay, well, then this is just cyberpunk. This is magic is cyberpunk where you have these gigantic tech firms the that create magical items, magical systems, and all of their spells are intellectual property that they want to guard very, very closely. Um, and um, if you understand how all of that works, you can abuse it and use it the way, the same way that hackers do. And it's been kind of unearthly now. Uh, so just to make this clear there, there is a point at which um, the main character, Sancha, finds a key that can talk to all these magical rules when it's touched to it and trick them. Because when you write all these rules on an, on an object, it gains a level of sentience. It says, like, here's my instructions, here's my programming, here's what I am to do. And when she touches Clef to it, both she and Clef can hear these instructions being said to itself again and again. And Clef can argue with it and talk it into doing things that it wouldn't normally do. The classic one is trying to get through a door and the door says it's supposed to stay locked. 
I'm not permitted to swing open, uh, uh, that, like under no circumstances, except if I'm presented with the correct like signals, will I open? And Clef says, well, what if you open the other way? What if you swing the other way? Does that count as opening? If you swing the other way, that's not breaking the rules. And it's like, that's a good point. And then it opens. He breaks the door open because he tricked it into doing something that they did not plan for. It has been a little bit weird to, in the age of chat GPT and all these language models, seeing people argue with them into accessing like large reams of data or getting to do or, or like getting them to do things that they are not programmed to do um, and seeing people say, hey, this is like Clef and Foundry side. Yeah. And I'm like, huh, I didn't think this would be happening so fast. I didn't, this was not something that I thought would, that I'd be seeing in my lifetime. But right. yeah, like the, um, the, like, I, like there are jobs now that are chat to GPT prompters where you have to learn how to think like an LLM to make it happen. And like, again, like uh, someone made this point, which was that these things, um, uh, the, the, that the only thing in fiction that we can really compare these two are the machine spirits from Warhammer 40k, where they're these gigantic, like spiritual AIs that you have to appease in order to get them to do stuff for you. And the people who like live under them don't comprehend them whatsoever, which is really interesting because like almost nobody understands how these things work. They're, they live inside of a black box and we don't totally understand why they do the things they do. It's fascinating. It's a weird time to be alive. And even if we interact with those things, it doesn't necessarily mean that we understand them. Like you say, it's like, mm -hmm. I, any time I recommend the founders trilogy to people, I said, it's like one of the best modern examples of cyberpunk. And they're like, but it's fantasy. And I'm like, just get that out right? of your head. Like, yes, you but will, also, you know, yes. Yeah. <laughs> yes, but no, but it's, it's really, it's really wild to hear you kind of, reminisce on the fact that it's like this fantasy trilogy that you wrote is now kind of coming to fruition in the real world in terms of not necessarily like prediction per se, because prediction is a bit of a, a bullshit thing when it comes to, to a lot of um, science fiction and whatnot. It's more like um, people see the analogous, echoes of it. Yeah. 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 It's the echoes. Yeah. It's like the analogies that people can draw between certain things, but it's like, it's kind of, scary that we're Spooky. you know because like reading the founders trilogy and the power that that sancha contain the the power that she wields by holding cleft on her person is more than any one person should have and i think we kind of underestimate the the power that ai has in the hands of people who are pretty ignorant to the realities of it yeah it's it's kind of a weird thing where like I thought about writing a science fiction series, but the world is too incomprehensible these days. Like I think you know, in the '60s and the '50s, you sort of when technology was moving in ways that were like frankly more robust than now. Like where you where you could see machines being built that would move Earth. We don't really see that happening anymore. We're not seeing new paradigms of moving around the world or creating new kinds of factories that that's kind of not what we're all about right now. I think, like, I think the paradigm, the paradigms that we're experiencing now are more invisible that we don't yeah. necessarily, we don't necessarily have the perception to pinpoint, like this is something that is changing the landscape of our world. Yeah. Like it's it, like, it's not hitting meat space as hard as we are expecting. Like, the last really big change was electrification. Uh, once we did that and we brought it to factories and started making stuff, that really changed everything because then suddenly it was possible to leave your job on the farm and come into town and get like a job that really changed everything in a significant way. We, we really have not, although we like to think that the internet has changed a lot of things that it has, it has not changed things on that level. It is not like the idea of having a little wire in your house. And if you touched it to it, you could, you could like wash your clothes without having to do anything like moving, like physical items. Like that is a, that's a level of change that I don't, that I think we take for granted and are, it, it, it's very hard to comprehend. Like the idea of the oven, like you just have this little string in your house, you tie it to this big box and you, and now it cooks your food and you don't have to start a fire and there's no smoke. <laughs> like 
that that's a level of change that I think that we that we really have no concept for anymore. But even even early um, on, it's like the ability for electricity to give us the capacity to do things past that past dark darkness. You know, it's like yeah, the sun light. sets. And we can do shit. We can continue to do stuff as opposed to like, we're going to like cook by fire and then, you know, get like bad lungs and then go to sleep at like a right. Us today would say like, that's an unreasonable hour to fall asleep. Like, what are you? Child? Right. As well as like how we built things. Like you had to build things with windows. Yeah. And you had to build things with chimneys. Otherwise you, this room was useless. Like you could not inhabit it. It could be a closet. But like, uh, like having rooms, chambers, hallways, things like that, that didn't have access to fire or light or the sunlight. That was a weird idea. Um, so like, but like now with the internet and now with like how things have globalized so much and we've become like a global consciousness and a global species, it's like much harder to predict. Like, I think it's much harder to predict, um, any much farther than five to 10 years out. It's like, I think, a, a stupid job to try and do that. And so um, it de- like that means to me that it, it, it's very difficult to work in science fiction. Uh, the simpler thing to describe the unreal world that we're working in is to place yourself in a situation of unreality, which is fantasy, um, and operate from there. Because that's the only story mode with the toolkit possible to describe and articulate the weird shit that's happening now, as well as... I did not want to have a bunch of tech people yelling at me that I did stuff wrong. Um, and so it makes it a lot easier to just you know, make it up as, as you go to have it uh, run in parallel to reality, but not be enough from reality that everyone can criticize me. Right. Like, I don't want all that shit in the reviews and the comments. Always yeah, the fear with sci-fi. That. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. There's that in guns. I find that the gun people are really big on telling you. You wrote, you a, did you guns wrote a book wrong. about guns oh, though. Yeah. Yes, yeah, so you dealt with this uh, first time. In like American Elsewhere, I referenced that a Glock has a safety. Apparently, Glocks do not have safeties, which to me is fucking crazy. That is pretty crazy. That uh, there's a gun that doesn't have safeties. And they were like, well, it's just such a reliable weapons system. I remember that weapon system. I was like, it's not a gun, it's a weapon system. <laughs> it's like the Winnie the Pooh meme, you know, where it's poo and then it's poo in a tuxedo. Yeah, yeah. It's not a gun, it's a weapon system. Oh. But I was like, I still don't like the idea that it's so reliable that every time you pull the trigger, it goes off. I don't understand. Um, maybe someone could explain that to me, but uh, yeah, they caught me on that one and I got, and I got some grief over that. But you're um, in, you're in yeah, Austin. Gun people, you're, in, come for you. you're in Austin, Texas. You're in gun country, man. You can go to a convention. Austin, not so much. I mean, no, a little bit. You kind of got to go. Austin, less so of no, a lot no, of Austin. <laughs> um, yeah. Texas and Texas yeah. in general, not necessarily Austin specific. Texas in general. Yeah. yeah. There's a lot of, <laughs> a lot of shooting ranges around town. Say Adrian but, yeah. is yeah. Canadian. He thinks that we're all, all of us in Murica are in gun country. Um, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I'm in so, I'm in Ecuador. I'm in narco country. Well, yeah, so you're in Ecuador I'm now. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you're from Canada. Well, I want to touch a little bit on um, some of the themes that are in some of your work. So in both Divine Cities Trilogy and the Founders Trilogy, uh, you're dealing with some pretty deep themes related to power structures and society. I actually, I just finished Shore Fall last night. Um, so... <laughs> No spoilers for Locklands. Uh, but how You're gonna do you cry. think? Deal I know I've been told that already. Um, <laughs> but how do you think that science fiction and fantasy offer a unique lens through which to examine these kind of challenging topics? And do you have any advice for writers looking to balance those kind of heavier themes with action, humor, wit, uh, like you do in your work? Yeah, I would say the th- the thing that I'm most preoccupied with in the Divine Cities Foundry side and the Tainted Cup is change, is how circumstances require change, how the evolution and suddenly the the rights of people, the resources they have, permit them to change themselves, to change how they prefer to live, to, to allow them to become more of themselves, um, and how change often leads to conflict, to disruption, um, to situations that at first seem better, but maybe not are. Um, and that's probably why a lot of my works are more akin to science fiction than they are to fantasy. Because fantasy frequently looks backward. I'm not the first one to point this out. But there was a, a post today about how, like, if you were a kid who grew up before the Internet, 
um, then it's a little like being an elf from Tolkien's world who saw the last light of the two trees. <laughs> mm, nice. And I was like, oh, okay. But like that kind of speaks to that trope in fantasy of there once was a wonderful world, but then through the follies of men uh, or through like mortals or whoever, things went terribly awry and now everything is broken and ruined. And if we could only get the right person on the throne, maybe we could regain some shred of that power. This kind of functions alongside the Garden of Eden, which is like once there was paradise, we fucked it all up. It's impossible to go back. We will never go back to utopia. But maybe if we prostate, if we prostate ourselves and whip ourselves enough and behave in this certain sort of way, we will invoke the powers of the divine to be granted some amount of favor and recover some shard of uh, utopia. Um, and uh, what bothers me about this is it's anti-progress. Like progress is not possible in these worlds because no matter how much you make things better, you're never getting back to the Garden of Eden. You're never going to get back to those two trees. You're just kind of making a shit show a little better. Um, and that also, I think, doesn't really describe the reality that I know where – like, if you go back one, two, three generations, um, I think, like, although they are still people, like, the systems are substantially more, frankly, barbaric. Where if you go back three or four generations, the amount of death that a normal human being experiences is far, far higher than we have any comprehension of. Like, it used to be, like, half, half the kids born would die before the age of, like, five. That was how it was. If you were alive, you'd seen dead babies. Uh, you had to go to the funerals. You had to bury them. Odds are your mom died at birth, all kinds of stuff. You go a little bit, bit further than that, then you um, then their odds are you have experienced some sort of insanely violent war that made absolutely no sense, probably race-based, probably faith-based. Maybe it was uh, ginned up by some king or some ruler for some reason that you didn't comprehend whatsoever. You don't know. It, like the the lesson is is that all of us come from uh, like ancestors who probably had insane PTSD, malnutrition, and serious CTE. They had brain damage. They were malnourished. They'd seen an incredible amount of death. They were constantly fighting insane levels of trauma that we probably can't comprehend. And the future was always uncertain for them. Food was scarce, undependable. Every winter, you freaked out. Um, Slavery was extremely common. Like one of the things that was kind of crazy was reading about like the 1200s and like the 1300s. You don't think of really slavery being a thing in Europe, but it totally it was. It totally was. Yeah. Yeah. Um, that's kind of skipped in some of these classes. Uh, but um, uh, like think things were bad. Like we are incredibly lucky to be alive right now. Things are insane as they are right now. Things could definitely get worse. There are lots of problems in the world. I do not deny that whatsoever. And we need to work on them with an incredible, with all of our might. But things were super bad. Like I don't like, uh, I can't recall the last time I took a shit by a tree. But that was <laughs> the default mode. The <laughs> they ripe your bubs. You better pick a good leaf. Don't um, pick poison oak, people. <laughs> yeah, that happened to Stephen King one time. He wrote a story about that. And he was really? four, like that. Oh my God. Yeah. Um, he, um, but um, yeah, so as a result, like, I, I don't think that fantasy has an extensive, cool, like, a toolkit for describing change as we know it. Um, the, like, like, trying to manage the advent of uh, industrialization. And the way that that grants enormous resources to new kinds of people and what they expect from that. Um, as such, that's why a lot of my stuff tends to function like science fiction, which is much more socially conscious, I think, of real world politics and, and real world conflicts. Um, and in trying to predict, if I introduce this tool or this method who would lose power and who would gain it and what would happen from that? That's like in a, that's a huge amount of science fiction uh, stories out there. 
And I like I've always tried to make sure that my fantasy stuff kind of sticks to that. Uh, Terry Pratchett is a big inspiration for this and that a lot of his uh, the stuff they did with uh, Discworld um, was more science fiction like oriented in that someone would find a magical process to make this thing happen. And then that would upend everything. Um, and so that's always been sort of um, my guiding star for a lot of that. Um, I'd say that the Divine Cities was a bit unique in that the tool that was used the most was history. Uh, the concept of history and how people use it in the present to form the societies that they want or to excuse what they want to do in the present. But history is fundamentally unknowable. Um, we can't really access it and we can't really comprehend it, especially when it, when it's hundreds, if not thousands of years ago. So you have all these guys who are trying to invoke the power of these gods that they've never seen and whose works they only have scraps of and who only kind of, like they don't really get what these gods are about, but they would like them to wipe out these people that they don't like right now in this moment. Um and like so for that one the gods work as a metaphor for history uh that's how i kind of thought of that one that's a little bit different from foundry side which was in the founders trilogy which was when i was trying to investigate my own feelings about technology because at the time when i was writing it in 2014 to 2016 there had been this sort of agreement that technology was bad that it just created lots of problems for everybody um, that, um, that like big tech was ruining everything that there, that we were no longer capable of producing technological solutions for ourselves. If we did pull, uh, produce a technological solution that helped something, someone would exploit it and ruin it. And it would in uh, like so much of the internet. Um, and so I was like looking at that and poking it and wondering like how true this was. Um, and the conclusion that I came up with is that there's a weird feedback loop between social programs and technological programs, like social progress and tech progress. Um, and you're never entirely sure if this progress that we have right now, it, is it 100% from social work, from creating new systems of governance, from becoming more enlightened about the rights of others, or... Is this the result of technological process? Like I would say like a lot of the comprehension of diversity that's happened now in the past 10 years, a lot of that's because of the Internet. Because like suddenly it was a lot easier to share videos of these things that were happening to like black people. And like it gave them voices where they didn't have one before. Um, and that created social structures that were still struggling to try and get that uh, to get um, – to get applied uh, in a way that actually results in real justice, um, which is really hard. But um, it, like, and so like, it was a, a, a weird conclusion that I feel like I came that I that I came toward, which was that it's an uneven sort of slouching towards progress, where one end gets pulled and then the other one gets pulled, and if they and if one gets too far ahead of the other or behind. It results in tragedy, which I think is true. Like the thing that I the uh, comparison that I think of is like the First World War and the Civil War, where our abilities to kill each other far outstripped our abilities to heal one another. Like it was the First World War was when we didn't just have guns, but we also had phones and trains, which were capable of dropping off tens of thousands of people and putting them behind tens of thousands of guns and shooting them all at each other. And then you that look was at the exponential thing. Thing. progress between World War One and World War Two. It's like yeah. the the time Planes. frame the time frame actually quickened between those mm. wars, and it's quickened ever since. Like the the exponential yeah. progress that we've seen has been has been wild and. Um, I think a lot of what you're talking about really applies to your newest book, The Tainted Cup, as well, which is a, you know, like a Sherlock Holmes and Watson kind of murder mystery, but blended with high fantasy world building and some um, similar to your other works, like a lot of politically and socially aware elements. So how did you kind of take this approach with The Tainted Cup? Because there's so much of what you're saying that rings true with how you laid out the world of the tainted cup, even though it's in the framework 
of fantasy and a murder mystery, how did you go about like blending genres in that way? These genres in particular, but then also applying the sort of um, intensive thought in terms of how you perceive the political and social and technological landscapes of, of our current age. Well, one reason why I wanted to do this was that I got really fucking lazy and I didn't want to have to do, because Foundry Site and all that stuff took a lot of work of writing all those rules. And I was like, I want something way easier this time. And I have a fundamental belief in the back of my head that like 90% of stories are actually mysteries. Something happened. We don't understand it. Let's try and figure it out. Um, and so I started thinking and like, I grew up on murder mysteries and my wife and I watched lots of, uh, lots of like murder mysteries. My mom and my grandma had a whole closet that was filled with like Dorothy Parker, um, and, uh, Agatha Christie, uh, not, not, not Parker Sayers, uh, and like Agatha Christie, um, about all of w- w- with all their stories and a member that we would watch them on like a and E and PBS and all this stuff back in the nineties on, um, cable. And so I've always been very much drawn to these, uh, to these stories. And they're also really simple. I mean, like you got a dead body to figure out who did that, that who, who, who did this, um, is a very simple story construct. And so I started thinking about the idea of an empire. Like I like the idea of something strange and a little bit unnerving. Um, and so like, um, I had the idea of, uh, someone who is not high on the totem pole, not powerful, having to function within this larger construct that was this fantasy like empire. And at first it was going to be chaotic and really dark and strange and more dystopian. Um, and then I kind of stopped and stepped back and I said, Like, I don't think that a murder mystery series, the way that I'm thinking of it, like the classic drawing room stuff from the 20s, 30s, and 40s, I don't think that those are inherently dystopic. And I started thinking about, like, why they really work as they do. And uh, if you read them, they're usually about someone who is um, like a lower class cop or someone who does not inherently have a huge amount of power. Like, this isn't a king. This isn't a prince. This is a worker or someone who's just smart and gets hired to do this, um, who goes through the systems of power and systems of of order to deliver justice. Like this is about the victory of order more than it is about how like through strength of will we can inflict order. And it is interesting, like these things were written in the 20s and 30s and 40s. Why would somebody want to see something about the victory of order? It's because there was chaos unfolding across the like whole goddamn planet where you had these people saying like the liberal uh, like like uh, like world order has failed us. All the bureaucrats have failed us. We have to throw it all out and create systems that are driven by might and power. And a murder mystery is not about might and power. The guy does not win because he is bigger and stronger and beats them up. It's because he patiently talked to everybody and figured it out Um, or just noticed somebody like the best one probably is Miss Marple, who is a frail old lady who succeeds because she paid attention to her village. And whenever she meets a murderer, she knows a corollary for their nature by referencing someone she knew from her village. Um, She is a regular person. And that's what makes these. Like, that's where this power comes from. These are like like normal people. And it seemed like now is a pretty good time to have an example of an empire that was generally trying to do the right thing and do good things and maintain order and have someone working as an investigator for that power. Like, you want to see these people solving murders because, you know, like, there's lots of problems with crime and punishment and all the, in like all the nations in the world right now, but it's kind of tough to say, I don't think we should solve murders. Right. <laughs> you want to see that one get, get fixed. That, that, that's kind um, of a, that's kind of a like baseline for most societies. It's like, right. yeah, we don't want to, make, <laughs> like we don't want to just brush this under the rug. Right. Like, ah, it's fine. No, no, like, 
Uh, there are some debates about like shoplifting and car theft right now. And now sometimes that's sometimes it's okay. We can let that one go, but murder, eh, it's different. Um, so, um, I had the idea of this empire and this person working as an investigator within it. Uh, but like, I, I think something else that speaks to the age right now is stress and huge amounts of change and huge amounts of problems that have to be managed and can't be managed privately or like individually. Like, for example, the war in Ukraine, like there was uh, there were like they had um, talks about how like it was ridiculous that the government was handing out all this uh, like all these weapons and things like that. Like this could be privately managed by private corporations. And it was like World War Two was not privately managed by corporations. That wasn't how that one went down. It was the government that had to step in and do this. Same thing for climate change. It is not possible for private corporations to fight this incredible threat. We need something bigger. We need to make, uh, and this was like the the pl- like the uh, sort of play on words that I w- was going with here. We need to make a Leviathan, like Hobbes's Leviathan. It's Hobbes, right? Get with the Leviathan? Am I crazy? I don't know. Crap. <laughs> All right. I think that's right. It's been a it's been a while since I thought of this. <laughs> um, it's all good, dude. But um, the the idea of the like state as this gigantic like entity that's capable of fighting big things, and what's bigger than a guy than a giant goddamn sea monster? Right. And so I had this idea that um, yes, you are correct. It is Hobbes. Okay, thank God. <laughs> but, uh, <sighs> Google's uh, but um, <laughs> yeah, I was about to start googling, but I was like, "It'd be kind of rude." This is my interview. I can uh, almost whatever. <laughs> but I had this idea of like giant sea monsters that would come ashore once a year and threat, like that would be immensely damaging and require a huge amount of effort and change and like intelligence. Uh, where you like this can't be beaten with one big guy with a sword. This is not something that, like, you know, a champion can destroy. This requires teams of very smart people using their brains to defeat. Um, And, like, that's the victory that the Empire has, is that is the victory of teams of bureaucrats working together. Um, And that's kind of something, like, that I think that we haven't really respected in a long time. We don't like the idea of, like, a big public work anymore, Like, we don't really do big dams. We don't really do big bridges. We don't celebrate the people who create and do this. We, in fact, make it pretty hard for them to do this these days. We're, like, trying to build um, things more. There's less value placed on architects and and the work that they do and and city planners and the people who basically – City planners. Yeah. Yeah. Like, I have a friend who's a transportation engineer and he's, like – That's got to be terrible. Nobody thinks about this shit, which is why he went to Europe. Where they do respect yeah. something like that. <laughs> a little bit yeah. more at least. <laughs> yeah. But like uh, like nowadays it's actually the thing that we do is we make it much harder to build these things where you uh, cap uh, like the like average person can sue and sue and sue until the price of these things go up so much that they just get abandoned. Um, so I wanted to sort of imagine a society that valued construction, that like like a bit like Rome – like value construction, the the construction of walls and bridges and homes and trying to find new ways to do stuff. And I started thinking about this like investigator and how they would go about doing it. Um, and I always had the idea of um, the way that the story would work was it wouldn't be Holmes and Watson, but it would be a somewhat less well-known style of sleuthing which was like like wolf and archie who um are from the like rex harrison novels i believe it's rex rex harris rex harris novels. um and the way that those works is that like nero wolf is a genius he's also 500 pounds and an asshole and refuses to leave his house he likes to stay up there, live his own life on his own schedule that cannot be changed. He likes to take care of his orchids. He likes his beer. He has a private chef, Fritz, I believe is his name, that he insists create all these unique like dishes for them. Uh, he's a genius and he can solve anything, but he won't leave his house. That's up to like Archie, who is a little bit more of a slick noir type. He does all the chatter and the jabber and stuff like that. Uh, he likes a cold glass of milk and he likes women. Uh, but it's his job to go out there, talk to everybody, take notes, get it all figured out and bring it back to Wolf, 
who then gets it all all figured out. Like it's a, like, and I started thinking of Wolf almost as like this computer in a box. You just go to the box, you consult it, and it says what to do next. And I was like, wow, that is really convenient for a plot structure. I love this shit. <laughs> um, and so I start. And so, like, uh, I started thinking about like having this like investigator, because I had chosen for a while there to have um, the magic in the story be like bio magic, where it was ways to like augment people to give them certain skills. Um, and the main character's skill would be he would have a perfect memory that he could consult, like browse almost like a book, and summon up the perfect like recollection of what had happened. And so his brain was like a, a recorder almost. And so he would go and talk to people and come back and vomit all this information out for this person that was like waiting for them. And this person would be someone whose mind was so enhanced and so brilliant that she actually found the world too interesting to live in, where she would seek patterns and leaves and in the grains of wood and brick and things like that and want to question everybody. And so she never leaves her apartments and she lives almost all of her days blindfolded where, but because she just finds the world too interesting. She's got to focus. Too too much stimulation. Right. Too distracting. Too much stimulation. Mm -hmm. Uh, Too distracting. Um, And as I started writing this, um, but like, I realized like she couldn't just be like Sherlockian. There had to be something weird and a little bit threatening about her. And uh, she's almost like a predator, like a caged predator. She's always hungry. She's always hungry for uh, she, like information. She felt like a Sorry? like she felt like a like a falcon or something like like that kind of predator that is very um, that is very intelligent, but it, like the the menace is not so obvious. As yeah, well, like, she, I mean, she here's even a lion eats or here's a like bear. raw meat. I mean, there's something yeah, yeah. very yeah, interesting about her. But it's, like, but it's her. like you can see this person is yeah. like there's a there's a sharpness to their to their uh, way of perceiving things, to their intelligence, but there's also like, there's some fucking sharp talons on this person too. There's something there. Yeah, <laughs> yeah there's something there. Yeah. Uh, and so like, I realized that it's really not Wolf and Archie, it was Hannibal Lecter was the thing that was close. <laughs> Ooh, <laughs> was so okay. Perfect. You've got a genius in a box Ooh. who's hungry to learn about all this fucked up shit. Yeah. And really the, the, thing, that, the thing that I realized was the moment where like in the movie, uh, Sounds of the Lambs, because the books are not very good, I've personally found. Um, uh, there's the part where she starts to describe the thing found in her throat, and he goes like, and he suddenly says, like, was it a butterfly? And it's this odd moment of like, how the hell did you guess that? I was like, that's what the detective should be like. This creepy, unearthly, how did you divine this? And that's how I came up with, uh, like, Anna. And it took me a while to get there, actually. In the first take, Din was the crazy one, and Anna was the more collected one, uh, where he was, like, a crazy, drunken, insane person who was fighting, like, PTSD. Well, that's very different from from the Din that uh, ended up on the page, yeah. (laughs) Cool. And so I sent it to my editor, and he was like, I I think this is – this isn't working for me. I'm not sure why. Why does it have to be so troubled? And I realized that the real error is if you have a, have a, like a genius and someone who works for the genius, who's the main character, the genius has to be the crazy one. It can't be the main character who is the one like, like it can't be the Watson who's insane. Um, and so that like that restructured everything for the story for me. And that was kind of one of the like moments that kind of helped it all like open up for me. And from there, yeah, like they seem to work together. Where she, like he is a little bit stiff. He's a little bit more at risk. He's trying to make money for his family. Um, he's more reserved, more watchful. He's more still. He doesn't talk as much. And she's just bouncing off the walls, vomiting like information left and right, uh, being a scandalous maniac. And he's just <laughs> having to suffer through it. Yes, and we love him for it. Well, well, I'm I feel like talk suffering about- through it is very, we- very applicable. <laughs> <laughs> it is so like, for oh, poor Din. But I want to talk a little bit about the structure because uh, the plot for the Tainted Cup is so delightfully intricate and so twisty. Um, and so I'm just curious, what was your plotting process like for the book? Do, did you plot ahead of time? Did you kind of discovery write it? Like, how, what did that process look like for you? Uh, I discovery wrote my way into sort of the best way to structure these things. And where there is a first small, like, mystery. 
that where something has happened and Din has to go look at it and bring it back to Anna, which she solves. But it doesn't lead to total conclusion. It suggests a greater mystery, at which point there is a giant like disaster or some greater crime that forces Din and like Anna to go to a secondary location that is far stranger, far more threatening, where the stakes really exist, um, that force them to then go about and start to look at the real clues, and then things get really super de duper naughty. Yeah, so naughty. Um, <laughs> the, where there's a lot of information, there's a lot of little pieces out there. Um, and Anna starts to slowly, like a symbol, all the various crimes that have happened. Um, and at some point in time, Din does some cool stuff with a sword. Um, and, and then there is a final murder uh, that gives Anna the final bit of information that she needs to conclude everything. That's more or less it. Uh, there's a lot in between then and there. One thing that was very critical was um, in between having to step into, like, there's the greater place that they go to where the stakes really are. There needs to be a place in there of privilege and power that is immensely threatening that Din goes to. Um, and I kind of decided that I was going to start to use these to poke fun at fantasy tropes uh, because I don't know how clear it is on the page but um, there's this very rich family that is immensely powerful and immensely altered, and everyone there is incredibly old. And they have this giant, ancient, uh, like, mansion. But they all feel a little bit like elves, I hope, where the princess is this pale, white, perfect creature with purple eyes and ethereal. silver hair. Ethereal is the yeah. one that yeah. when I was when I was reading. Yeah. She's been augmented so that she releases like pharaohs that you find like bewitching, especially men. Um, and um, she plays this role of being this elf princess almost to a perfect degree. Um, and uh, it's only when you like see behind the, the ploy that you realize this is a dangerous person who's also an asshole and thinks that you're vermin. And I, I think that most elves probably would. Uh, I think that if elves were real, that they would think that we were, they would think that we were rodents more or less. And maybe there are, I'm sure that there are stories out there where the elves are like that and they have no redeeming qualities and are not the chosen children of God as they are in Lord of the Rings. Uh, but, um, yeah, like, uh, like, like I realized that if we ever got to a place where elves could be something genuinely achievable, that they would treat the rest of us like shit. And that's what happens in the story. But it's really good. Like. It seems simple when you kind of lay it out like that, but honestly, most mysteries are when you lay out the base facts of how this progresses and, and the things that happen, the general movements of the mystery. But obviously it's like when you're in the middle of reading it, mixed in with all the world building and all the character building and all that kind of stuff, which we will talk about in the next episode, there is, I think, more, um, there's more punch to the twists there's more punch when the information is dropped at a specific time and when when discoveries mm. are made it feels more um it feels more like mind blowing because of the ways in which the world and the characters are reacting to those things and we won't spoil anything specific about the tainted cup but i think this is the that's the first book i finished in in 2024 and it's a fucking great way to start the year so thank you very much sir and i highly recommend everyone pick it up when this episode goes live but uh yeah just bravo man thanks for a good time <laughs> sure, absolutely uh, it like it was a lot of fun to write i think that i kind of startled my editor that like i wrote it pretty quickly um one other rule that I had was that you was that uh, because like originally there's one character in there who's very, very altered to the point that they're almost an inhuman monster. And my editor very quickly was like, I don't think that you can do that. This is a murder mystery. They all need to be people. Like if you have one character who is this monster owned by by these by this like one group in here, that kind of undermines everything. Like these all need to be people doing things for people reasons. And I was like, that's a really good point. So I actually had to go back and retool the final third of the story in a significant way because like you, 
Like that's not how a murder mystery works because a murder mystery is about people solving people problems, uh, which is a little tricky for a fantasy story because people always want to like they, they kind of desire you to include more and more of the uncanny. But I, I think that the uncanny like is all like is in many ways a resource that people use to achieve people based ends. Like these are all humans doing human stuff. When they call upon the uncanny, it is often for very human reasons. Yeah, and it's up to a certain point, like using a tool but without overusing it and, and making the story feel a bit like too overburdened in, the, in, in, in certain sense where it pulls the reader out of the experience as opposed to pulling them deeper into it. Yeah. All right, yep. buddy. Well, uh, winding down, MJ and I are curious. What does the future hold for you? And can you tell us a bit about what you are working on next? Uh, I just finished the second draft of the sequel to the Tainted Cup. I don't know if the title and all that has been confirmed, but I'm really looking forward to it. It was a lot of fun to write. Um, And I have started a couple pages of the third book in the series. Um, I really like writing these. This is one of my more fun things to, to do. Um, so I like really enjoy this world. I enjoy these characters and I enjoy the setup. I'm hoping to like, if I had my druthers, I very rarely get my druthers, but, um, it would be (laughs) fun if I could, um, just keep firing these puppies out and people keep reading them because this is sort of like a a tool I can use to attack almost anything that I find interesting with, with people that, uh, with like characters that I enjoy and a world that's a lot of fun and a format that, is very flexible and can be useful for almost anything. Very flexible indeed. Well, man, yeah. I'm very excited for, right? for the future of Din and Anna. But, I'd uh, say having finished out, book one, I can't wait for book yeah. two. <laughs> yeah, man. All right, well, uh, can you give listeners and viewers, A, a good bit of soundbite writing advice, and B, tell us a weird or random fact that you find to be utterly fascinating? Okay. Uh, so writing advice... St- start as close to the action as possible is one of the things that Kirk Vonnegut said. And he's right. Trying to remember that is very, very tricky. Um, I would always start with someone seeing the action coming and right before it happens, like, like, that's not a good way to put it. I was saying like the, the like inciting moment is an establishing moment for the characters, for the plot, the world, everything. Starting a book is the hardest thing you're ever going to do. Finishing the book is very, very easy, frankly. Um, But starting it at the right point is the same thing as a spaceship trying to reenter the atmosphere at the right angle so it doesn't fucking explode. Um, It takes... So step very carefully, and you'll know that you kind of got it in the right place when it all starts firing naturally, when the words just kind of start coming. Um, and so it is critical, like the way to think about it is that you want to see the inciting moment that is going to draw the character into this world. And so you need to have some idea of the character, you need to have some some idea of the moment, and some idea of the world that automatically pulls them into it, the same way that the the like audience is pulled into it. That is the best way to put it. If it is like, you know, if you are starting your story with a still scene or a hidden thing coming that no one can comprehend, that's not a great way to do that. Uh, Because uh, that, that makes it much harder for the audience to grasp stakes, uh, to grasp why this hidden thing is important. Um, It is like things don't really kick off until you see someone getting pulled into the story the same way that the audience gets pulled into the story. Agreed. Uh, Agreed. Bizarre fact, uh, clownfish can change their sexes. Um, (laughs) If the female dies, then there is a fight among the clownfish uh, group uh, to become, and the strongest one becomes the female, which is, I think, up into a little bit of a sexual (laughs) uh, archetypes as we have them, which (laughs) means that in Finding Nemo, the dad would have become a lady, and then Nemo would have fucked his dad. (laughs) Oh, no. That fact (laughs) should turn. Great lesson for for Pixar fans out there. (laughs) I, 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 like, I I tweeted this fact. The the title Finding Nemo has a whole new meaning now. Yeah. (laughs) Mm. Uh, But, um... 
Yeah, I tweeted this fact out, and then someone quickly pointed that out, and I was like, man, it's 937. <laughs> you can't be busting that on me at 937. It's too I'm early for night. that. Oh, it's too <laughs> early for transsexual clownfish incest sex. It's too early for that. Oh, brilliant, man. Well, on that lovely yeah. on that lovely note, uh, thank you so much for hanging out with MJ and I today. Um, it's been a sure, pleasure absolutely. chatting, as always, good sir. If you could please let everyone know where they can find you online. Uh, I am on Twitter at Robert J. Bennett. I'm on Blue Sky as something akin to that. I don't remember blue sky social <laughs> internet web. Um, I am on Instagram. I post things occasionally. Uh, and I'm also on threads, but I don't do a lot there yet. I'm waiting for a big reason to do stuff on threads. And I have a website, I think. <laughs> and you got, some, you got a bunch of I don't of books. do anything with my website. You do I mean, have a website and your author bio on there says something about your, uh, your writing books and not updating your website. And I thought it was funny. Well, <laughs> that's, that's very, it. that's very, that's yeah. perfect, man. We'll touch that thing. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. All right. Well, you can also follow SFF Addicts on Instagram, Twitter, threads, blue sky, all that shit at SFF Addicts pod. You can follow me at Adrian M. Gibson. MJ, what about you? Yeah, you can find me everywhere at MJ Kuhn Books, all one word, or mjkuhn.com. Perfect. That's it for this episode. Stay tuned next week for part two with Robert for our mini masterclass on connecting world and character. Now, keep reading, keep imagining, and we'll see you next time on SFF Addicts. <laughs>